Welcome to another episode of Debatable with your hosts, Nina and Kyle. I'm Nina. I'm Kyle. And for today, we want to go beyond the conversations of debate. And as promised, like a few weeks ago, we're going to talk about the Philippine general election. Because we think that this is an important topic to know, whether you're a debater or not. We think that this is one way we can help in terms of educating people in general about politics, especially in the Philippine context. And we think that overall, this is... Well, I, I, I have a lot of feelings about it, which is why... I want to talk about it. So, for the next few episodes, we're going to just be talking about the general elections. For this series, we're going to be discussing our own research. We're going to talk about our interviews with other guests. We're actually going to have some um, on this podcast. Plus, we're going to be talking about our own personal opinions. Nina is speaking as a poli-sci major. Mm-hmm. I am speaking as a law student. Just why I'm probably going to talk about the constitution here and there. No, <laughs> but basically, um, we think we want to be able to contribute in our little way of course though um, there's a lot of things you need to note and a lot of disclaimers before we continue because we know that this is a rather technical issue it's a sensitive one as well so we just want to make certain things clear first of all neither of us have full mastery nor do we claim to have absolute authority when discussing the matters at hand we acknowledge our own limitations because there will always be someone more experienced or more knowledgeable than us but at the very least we both feel that like we can and we should share what we do know and have learned through our studies and insights and our own research the second disclaimer would be that as much as this is a primer, we are pretty sure there's more to discover, especially since this is still an ongoing um, event. There's still a lot of issues and controversy around it. So we recommend that you take this episode as sort of a guide and complement to your own research. So don't just take everything we say face value, which leads to the last disclaimer. We're going to be trying to be as objective as possible. But if our own opinions come out, please note that these opinions are purely our own. They don't reflect the views of our school, our organizations, affiliations, etc. Um, So overview of the series, we plan on having three episodes or more. It depends really on what we decide to discuss. So the first would be a general overview of the elections. So what's happening? Why is it important? The next episode would be about the campaign or what we think went wrong. We actually interview um, several people for this and then lastly we're going to talk about po- possible aftermath so this last episode is mostly speculation with what philippine politics may end up looking like due to the results of this election we're going to be giving like an overview and also like a refresher of what's really at stake and what's so special about this election in particular yeah, but so, like in general mm. i think there are some important to know basics before we'll be able to fully grasp the importance of this particular election. Yep. We have the Philippine general elections. What does that entail? So it's basically the Philippine midterms. So there are three um, things that are important that we vote for. So first is the 12 seats of Senate, obviously, um, which is where most of the controversy lies. The second would be all provincial level, city level, and municipal level positions in government. And lastly, all the seats in the House of Representatives. So you could see it as a overturn of all of the other institutions um, besides the executive branch and the judiciary, basically the legislative branch. So the thing about the Senate is that it's actually composed of 24 members, but every three years you have senatorial election Mm -hmm. where 12 of them get replaced. So the term lasts for six years. The people who the Magic 12 are going to be replacing have been sitting in the Senate since 2013, and they're going to be replaced 2019. Every June 30, every three years, half of the Senate gets replaced. And the reason for that is because the Senate is a continuing body, so it can't, you can't just like scrap the entire thing and replace the entire thing. You always need to have remnants of the old Senate in order for you to have this idea of continuity of policy making, etc. And if you notice, a lot of the people who won in this senatorial election was already actually part of the Senate. And that's because senators can be in office for until two consecutive terms. So, so how many years is that? Theoretically, 12 years. Yeah, yeah. 12 consecutive years. But what's special about this election? Um, so there's a lot of stake, actually. And like uh, a lot of my professors, even in UP, say this. So Ramon Siple, for example, executive director of the Institute of Political and Electoral Reform, says that uh, a lot's at stake because it gauges the popularity of Duterte. 
still, and we all know how that turned out. It also may determine the fate of federalism in the country, another very prominent issue, one that has been debated so many times in our community already. Um, it can also, for example, um, look at power shifts, which is what um, Dr. Francisco Magnus says when he states that what's at stake is the very essence of democracy because it determines what future policies are going to look like, um, what kind of laws and what new culture when it comes to creating policies and creating ideas will happen in our state-level institutions. Right. So Senate in particular is what we want to focus on because there's a lot of drama as well in the House of Representatives. There's also a lot of drama in the provincial level, city level, municipal level positions. But I think what's the most important right now uh, would be to talk about the senatorial elections because in the end, you will end up talking about other po- politicians as a result. National politics is just a bigger scale version of um, municipal politics or um, local governments. So it's very important to understand Senate in order to understand everything else because everything's interconnected, as we stated in our previous episode about scales. Yes. Oh, tie back. Tie <laughs> tie back. back. Yeah. And also we think that the numbers game is extremely crucial, especially because if you're talking about the Congress, you have the two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate, and basically both houses need to be in agreement towards a particular policy. So in the past, you had a bunch of policies that were passed in the House of Representatives because the House of Representatives was already controlled by this administration, yeah. so Duterte and people who agree with him. PDP Laban, for example. Um, so things like the death penalty passed in the House but was rejected at the Senate. Yeah. So the Senate seemed to be a check and balance to the House of Representatives. To the House of Representatives. But that might have changed completely yeah, now. Yeah, that might have changed completely. So the numbers game here is very crucial. We're talking about key issues like federalism or again a death penalty, the war on drugs, um, the minimum age of criminal responsibility, mm-hmm. um, how do we demand accountability for from Duterte, yeah, and the whole thing about impeachment, yeah, like if impeachment is ever going to be on the table, it need you need to have an impartial and independent Congress, yeah, these types of things, and also like the culture thing, like let's not forget what kind of strongmanship Duterte is offering, and as actually he's very polarizing as a figure, right? Yes, that's your that's, that's your thesis. thesis. Yeah. But but basically, um, what's important again to note is it, it may seem like. A list of things that are at stake but they all boil down to the idea of power and the distribution of that power and right now it's kind of skewed so what we want to do now is discuss really a detail of what what has the past few years with Duterte look like and why are we so scared actually of the next few years to come so if you've been matter loaded um, there's a lot of telltale signs that Duterte is trying to be a populist leader. Um, so the first would be the machismo culture, for example. Like it, it, It's very prominent now how Duterte disregards women around him. Like multiple issues, like the rape joke that he made for um, the nun, for example. Yeah, the kissing of the Korean, yeah, yeah. Korean national. Mm-hmm. Um, even his comments to the military that they should shoot women in the vaginas because that's... Because uh, it... it, it not only was it violent towards women, but it also says that um, you shoot them there because they are nothing more than their vaginas. So it's like two offenses in one statement, right? Um, so basically, that, that kind of culture is something that's um, being promoted, I'd say, or tolerated by Duterte's administration. Even the so-called feminist in government, as of now, just kind of tolerate it. Right. Who is that? Pia Cayetano? Pia Cayetano. Yeah, Pia yeah. Cayetano, who, who won again. Um, by the way, she's on her second um, consecutive term already. But basically, it, it just shows tolerance for it. And that's um, rather scary. Or another thing to note is the balance of power. Like, just take note of who Duterte has tried to put in jail. Like, obviously, law will try to say it's impartial and that the decisions are justified. But obviously, yeah, they're, no, politically, yeah. they're politically motivated. So the arrest of Laila de Lima for yeah. some drug lord thing that was made up that during her hearings, they demanded to see her sex state for some reason. Yeah. Right? Also, I think it was weird about... Well, it's not weird, but just something to note. Right, you had the magic 12 and they were supposed to replace 12 senators. Yeah. Actually, in reality, they're replacing 11 
because one of the seats is vacant because Lila is in jail. Yeah. And yeah. that's also interesting to note. Like, you think you have 24 uh, senators right now. You don't. You have 23. But they're going to be 24 again after June 30th. Right? Um, so, we, we you lost one powerful vo- voice in Senate because of Lila de Lima. Let's not forget the impeachment of Sereno, which I, I think was ridiculous. Um, I'm not sure of the technicalities of the law for that one. Oh, uh, do, do you want me to tell you? Yeah, go go okay, ahead. Okay, so um, she was impeached through a co-warranto. So a co-warranto is like, as it was applied in Republic of the Philippines versus Sereno, her qualifications were void from the beginning. So her nomination was void from the beginning also. Because, because she, she didn't she, declare, right? The, the, the sal ends. Yeah. yeah and the, the legal problem with that is like, in the constitution, it says that the chief justice may be um, removed through impeachment. And lots of people think that, lots of people interpret that as saying that she, that's the only way to impeach the chief justice. Mm. So the Republic said, no, we can use co-warranto because the constitution uses the word may. may. Oh. So it's not the only choice. It's just one of the choices. But like, if you look at the spirit of the document, mm. it, it really seems like it should be up to the legislature to conduct impeachment trials. So what the judiciary should have done was to just call out Serena mm-hmm. and then refer her case to the Senate. That already proves that not only have we lost the House of Representatives, even the judiciary right now is at stake because of what Duterte has allowed to happen. I'm going to get into a discussion later on on what I really think Duterte's role in all of this is. Because I, I don't think he's a mastermind as everyone claims him to be. He's yeah. not that genius, really. Um, but that's, again, my opinion. Um, but we'll discuss that later. But basically, like what Lila and Sereno have proven so far is that like you're, no one's safe. Um, not even Lila and Sereno. Res, uh, Maria Ressa also. Yeah, Maria Ressa. Yeah, a lot of powerful women being taken out. Right? Even non-government. Individual. People not in the government are also at risk. Yeah. Yeah, um, people from the media, ganon. Mm. Like, I remember when Kyle and I were prepping for this episode, like, he noted that it was mostly women being targeted, like, Laila, Sereno, Ressa. Um, so, he asked me if there was any significance to that. And, honestly, I don't think so. Um, I just think it's a coincidence that they were women in power. And Trillianes is actually, like, proof that Duterte doesn't really care <laughs> if the targets are women or not. Like, people say he's probably just targeting women because they're easier to target. Um, but even Trillianes was a victim of Duterte's politics. Like, he didn't declare something again. What was that? He was challenging. No. Oh, okay, that's me. What was it? So the was amnesty it? was Void ah, Abinicio. Okay, yeah, like, the amnesty. Void from the beginning because he didn't apply for it, I think. Yeah, so okay. if you don't apply for an amnesty, you won't be given it. Yeah, some, yeah. something. I, I think we'll probably have to matter load more on that. You probably have to matter load more on that as well. But all of these are important contexts to understand. Um, what's happening. So that's yeah, like so the, what's at stake. The, what's at stake. So that's the balance of power right now and I don't think it's in favor of the opposition. What happened and who are involved? Obviously, we also have to talk about who the senators are. Based on the final 12 and the reason why it took rather long for this episode to be filmed, uh, filmed, recorded, was because at the time I was writing the initial script, we really didn't even have a magic 12 yet. Right. There were instances where Bam yeah, could have Bam been in there. Yeah, Bam was in and then out yeah, for a few times. Yeah, it was times. a roller coaster. But now, for sure, he's out. Um, sadly, he in conceded, instead, right? instead, yeah, he already conceded. Instead, we have this this mess of uh, twelve. You have Cynthia Villar, um, who topped actually. I was kind of surprised because I didn't really see much advertisement. I think it's just name recall, probably name recall, right? Well, no. Where I live, mm. Saint Villar was everywhere. Oh, okay. Like, um, but then again, I, I live near Dang Hari, so. Ah, uh, right. Dang Hari yeah. is the the Villar Road. Yes. Right. right. Um. So we have Grace Poe, um, which at first seemed like a independent individual, um, hopeful. We were hopeful that she would be a strong opposition, especially when she ran for presidency. Right. She was the main contender against Mar Rojas. But even now, she sides with Duterte. She does the fist. Um, no, she didn't. She didn't do the fist. Yeah, at the... Oh, she didn't. Yeah, she didn't. Like, Nancy and Grace didn't do the fist. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. But but I think she's trying to pose herself as an independent. As independent. But that wasn't her track record. And I don't know what's this change of values now. Perhaps she's trying to appease to 
appeal to the opposition or maybe it's just a strategic thing We're not yeah sure. i think it's a strategic thing where she wants to be at least palatable to people who are in full support of the opposition but i i think she kind of is a palatable way for us to get a bit of neutrality back in senate yeah that's why she won number two yeah i mean like mm-hmm. she, she was never like overtly fond of Duterte, I think she just expressed support for him a few times. Mm, but still support. But it's not like I agree with yeah. Duterte, etc. I mean, I think that's why Grace Poe is a rather polarizing figure when it comes to debates as well. I've had so many Philippine politics debates, and Grace Poe is always an issue. Like, is she uh, for the opposition? Is she pro Duterte? At this point, like she's playing her cards really well. We're not sure. Yeah. Um, Bongo. Uh, which I, I don't even want to talk about Bongo. He just takes selfies all the time. He's basically... Hey, the, no. He, he's been working for Duterte for years. So. Yeah, which makes it worse. Yeah. He's just Duterte's lapdog. Um, what can he contribute to Senate? I'm not sure. My biggest fear is he might just be a yes man. He already is a yes man, but he becomes a bigger yes man now yeah. that he has the power to say yes to actual important things. Right? Um, we also have Pia Cayetano, which again, fake feminist. Uh. Well, I won't say she's absolutely fake. Uh yes, but she's I would not say that much. she's inconsistent. Inconsistent. Yeah, so she's she does pass a lot of like pro women legislation. To be fair to her, mm. but she's still silent with regard to Duterte's rape jokes and misogyny. So what I would say is, it just feels like she's even more fake now. Yeah. Because what we see the most is Duterte's misogyny and her silence over it. Yeah. yeah. Um. Next we have Bato. Um. Isn't Which, it Bato? Ba- Bato? Bato? I, I'm not sure. Bato? Uh, he, he's called the Philippine Rock by a lot of the uh, other media outlets outside of the Philippines. Which Has- I can Hassan see Minaj, right? Yeah, called yeah. Him the rock. yeah, he called him the Rock. Um, what are his policies? Well, again, g- given that he's like a policeman. PNP. Yeah. PNP head. Yeah, he's, he's a policeman. So therefore, a lot of his um, campaigns are anti-crime. Uh, again, hyping up the war on drugs. Yeah. Uh, which obviously worked. Um, but not only that, it also works because a lot of the media covered too much of him. Whether bad publicity or good publicity. Still publicity, right? Um, as long as you get name recall, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a- another issue surrounding um, this senator was the, the his PhD, right? So many people were like, give him a chance. He has a master's, he has a PhD, he is qualified. So it brought up a debate again about like educational... Require uh, educational attainment and does it matter? Like even online, a lot of KDDS posts their like CVs just to prove a point that I am pro Duterte, but I'm also very intelligent. Well, I I don't think it should matter. I think it just matters more in light of Who Miriam. Have, uh, I don't know, like Miriam mm. saying that people are stupid and <laughs> she always has this thing about educational attainment. Yeah. She always yeah. has. So I, I think our nostalgia for MDS leads us to fixate on the educational attainment, especially for De La Rosa, who keeps saying that he's an idiot in things. But I don't think it's a good precedent at all because constitutionally speaking, there is a reason why there is no substantive educational requirement in order for you to run or to vote. Yeah, just the ability to read and write. And yeah. the logic for that is... It- even because they have to make sure you're able to make policies. The reason for that is because you have to be able to fill out your candidacy form. Yes. Yeah, right. So so that's why he's a rather polarizing figure. Not to a lot of debaters, because we all know where we stand um, when it comes to that. But it's also very interesting to note the controversies and issues that he's managed to bring up, um, which I think might be interesting debate motions in the future, but I'm not sure. So next, I guess the next person I want to talk about, given the educational attainment issue, is... I mean Marcos. Right? Oof, so, I mean Marcos. So she won, um, despite lying about everything. And I, I think people conflate the two. We're not really mad about her lack of educational attainment. It's the... Lying, it's actually. The lying. <laughs> like, how dare you? Not only are you dumb, <laughs> but you're a liar. <laughs> no, and, and remember what Sarah Duterte said? She said that honesty. honesty is not the main standard by which we should decide who to vote for. And l- lots of people thought about Aimee because she wasn't completely honest with her yeah. credentials. But public office is a public trust. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, it was a very confusing statement to make. But again, the statement was made. You can't do much. I think besides her educational attainment, also important to note the fact that 
She's, she's the child of Ferdinand Marcos. <laughs> yes, uh, very important. Um, she's the child of Ferdinand Marcos. Which... The most corrupt leader in all of history. Of all of history, really? Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Well, at least the Philippines has won records and awards for something. Wow. <laughs> so basically, um, her as well. I think we also have Sonny Angara, which in particular, I don't know where I stand. I'm mostly against him. But because of train? Because of train. Um, but has he been super pro Duterte these past years? I'm not sure. Has he? Well, he's, not I overtly, I would say. He's LDP, right? So basically, he's he's someone who's also easy to persuade towards Duterte's side, which is also rather scary. Um, you yeah, have Francis Tolentino. Francis Tolentino. Um, Coco Pimentel. Mm-hmm. I think Coco Pimentel ran under PDP Laban. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, you have Bong Revilla. Uh, I don't wanna. You know what's interesting about Bong Revilla is his name on the ballot was not Revilla. His name on the ballot was Bong Revilla. So right, you you, you put the last name first and then the first name. Mm-hmm. But people know him so much as Bong Revilla. So his last name on the ballot was Bong Revilla, comma Ramon. <laughs> Can you do that? Like change your name to give you an edge in the elections? Because obviously V comes up a lot sooner in the ballot than R would. Well, I think I actually don't think so because the general rule is you can only change your name if your name opens you up to ridicule mm-hmm. as a child. So there are guidelines. Oh really? Like in in the rules of court. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Because you need to petition to have your name changed. Yeah. Except if it's just a typographical or clerical error in mm. the birth certificate. Mm. Oh, what am I talking about? But basically, how do how do how does he? Anyway, like, that's in, that's interesting, but it's not the most far from the most important thing about him. Okay. The most important thing about him is his plunder case. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the most important case. Sorry, we got carried away with the ballot thing. But yeah, um, he's a plunderer. We have another corrupt person in office. No surprise. He was acquitted. He was acquitted. He was acquitted. He was acquitted because the prosecution was not able to prove that he was the one who signed um the documents that acknowledged his possession of the money. So what does that mean? And why So there was definitely money stolen. Yes. And the Sandigan Bayan found that there was money stolen. Mm. The problem was the Sandigan Bayan wasn't able to find that Bonvilla himself consented to the plundering. Mm. He was saying that his signature was forged by someone else. Mm. Yeah. Um finally have Nancy Binay. Uh, another polarizing figure. Like it's he, very he, polarizing. Yeah, for us, yeah. Because uh, at the beginning, no one liked her. Um, she was like everyone hated her for her last name, um, the associations. And again, uh, I agree, she was a rather sketchy character. But now she's shown some signs of redemption. Um, she didn't raise her fist during the um, photo op for the new senators. Um, she has been. Kind of vocal against Duterte once in a while. Um, she's yeah. she she has a redemption arc, and I think that's what everyone calls it. But again, I think it's too soon to call. But again, I think she just proves to be someone that can be swayed towards Duterte side or the side of the opposition. So we'll just have to see how that unravels, right? So those are the magic twelve. Magic because I'm not sure why they're there and why they deserve to be All right. there. So magic twelve people they're replacing. Um, so, Sonny Angara was there since before, since 2013. Yeah, so he's a re-electee. Yeah, a re-electee, along with Nancy, Coco, Coco Pimentel, Grace, Grace and, and Villar. Villar. So, the people who are being changed are Bam, Javier Hercito, Chisa Escudero, Gringo Hanasan, Lauren Legarda, mm-hmm. and Trillianes. So, you have this Magic 12, and they're going to stay here until 2025, June 30, mm-hmm. along with as of now, I think you have Frank Rilon, Joel Villanueva, Tito, Tito Soto, Ping Laxon, mm-hmm. Dick Gordon, Gordon. Mig Zubiri, Kel- Manny Pacquiao, yeah, uh, um, Kiko Pangilinan, Risa Honteveros, mm-hmm. Win Gachalian, and Ralph Recto. Yeah, Ralph Recto. So, given the 24 that we have right now, it, it, I think it's a really interesting dynamic because you have a dominant, dominant Duterte power in the Senate right now with a little sprinkle of independence and perhaps yeah, you, some opposition here and there. But I think the true number, opposition is in the other 12 that's going to last until 2022. Yeah. So the three people from the LP. Liberal Party, so Frank, Joel, um, Kiko, 
Yeah. Maybe Rizal Tiveras as well. Yeah, I think... E- even though she's from Makbayan. Yeah, but she's very vocal against Duterte. And I think at this point, um, the left parties are more or less in line with the rest of the opposition anyway. Like, Makbayan yeah. has also been against Duterte consistently since a particular point in time. Yeah. But that's another discussion. But um, the point is, they are also an important ally that we need to note. So basically, that's the rundown of all the senators that we think are important to note and discuss. Um, again, do your own research. There's so much more to know about these people. Like, learn about the plunder case. Know why people are so angry. Learn more about Bongo. Like, he may be known as a selfie selfie god. <laughs> but, Not really, oh god. <laughs> but, but there's also more to his policies that might be rather dangerous in the long run. But again, we're going to discuss those um, in a future episode. So in the next episode, we're going to be talking about the campaign. We're going to be talking about what issues might people have had with the opposition's campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, as an opposition, what could we do in the future? Mm-hmm. Um, in the episode after that, we're going to talk about, again, the possible aftermath. Yeah. We're probably going to be discussing whether or not we're doomed. Yeah, because... uh, uh, we're probably also going to insert somewhere there discussion of the elections themselves. Like what happened with Comelec? Uh, what happened with all the precincts? What happened with all the machines? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, so that's what you can expect for the next episodes. I'm having a lot of fun. This is something I really like talking about. <laughs> I'm having fun as well. Wow. Just because you get bit. to talk about the loss here and there. Right? So, again, um, we hope you enjoy. We hope you learn more about this. This is really important. Um, not just for you as a debater. Because definitely, these are going to be topics you're going to be debating about soon but also important to know about as a Filipino if you're not a Filipino and you're listening to this podcast oh thank you for making it this far but I think it's also important to know about the politics of other countries so you can find parallels to your own so that's it for this episode of Debatable my name's Nina my name's Kyle yes and we'll see you in the next one bye 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 bye